Minnesota Roadside Attractions is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money by the vote of the people November 4th, 2008. One of the major economic drivers in Minnesota is tourism. People come from all over the world to enjoy the state's many lakes, rivers, and forests. As you travel around north central Minnesota, you will notice many roadside attractions and monuments. Come with us as we explore the history and significance of some of the roadside attractions that help define the identity of the communities in north central Minnesota. We start our journey in Alexandria, where Big Ole symbolizes the Viking pride that much of the state has embodied since the discovery of the Kensington runestone in the late 19th century. My name is Taryn Flolid, and I am a research volunteer at the Douglas County Historical Society in Alexandria, Minnesota, and we're at the Runestone Museum talking about Big Ole, who was one of our iconic images from Alexandria. The Kensington runestone was found out by Kensington, Minnesota on the Olaf Ullman farm. So the runestone has a narrative story. That story is really kind of a romanticized version of what Viking exploration could have been. And so that's where the Viking part comes in. It's something that's on postcards and represented on a lot of businesses and note cards and things over the years. But he was built originally as part of an exhibit for Minnesota for the World's Fair in 1965. And then after that, he was brought to Alexandria and they put his statue right at the intersection of Main Street and Broadway. And so at that time, you know, you could drive by he was at the, on every postcard at the very end of Broadway, you could see him. And he was something that was really supposed to promote tourism in Alexandria. Also, every town needs their big fiberglass statue, whether it's a fish or a prairie dog or whatever. So after a while, when the highway was widened and things were changed, they moved him back a little bit, but he was still in the middle of the road. And there was a lot of controversy then because people liked him right there on the main road. One of the problems was a lot of tourists wanted to stop and take photos standing on him, below him. And then they've moved him even farther back by Lake Agnes to the park that used to be part of the railroad yards. So more and more people get to stop and take photos and he's become a centerpiece of the park. But there's still some controversy. If we post a picture of him on Facebook in the old place, there's always a lot of people who have a little comment to make about his location. You wouldn't think that, but so. When I lived here in the 60s, Big Ole was just part of everyday life. You drive by in the car, on the school bus, and there he was. And then at one time, the downtown merchants had a nice jingle at Christmas time. They wanted people to shop local, and that was before the big box stores had moved into this area. And it was, they called downtown Alexandria Santaville, USA. And so they had, I believe it was a Mrs. Anderson, sewed this costume, big Santa suit, out of yards and yards and yards of material. And her daughters still talk about it in their house. And when they sewed the Santa suit, then they put it on him and they made a Santa hat. They took his, his spear out of his hand, made a great big Christmas gift to put over his shield. And the Santa, his bag was in his spear hand, so he had a big sack over his back. And it looked really good and a lot of people came to see him. And then one morning on the way to school, we looked out the car window and he was burnt to a crisp just black and bubbly. Someone, and they, I've never heard who, but there's always been rumors, um, shot a flaming arrow at him or, or used kerosene or something and set him on fire. So then they took that down and took him down, sent him away, and had him repainted and redone. After that, people still thought that he should have a Santa suit, but 
that and the, the fact that he was burned once in the combination that if there had been an ice storm or something like that, his suit would have become so heavy it would have collapsed him. So they, they were risking it either way, I think. So that, that never happened again. They never dressed him up as Santa. Well, because he's such an iconic tourist attraction, there are people from all over the world that come here for vacation or driving through, especially Scandinavians, and they have their picture taken at Big Ole's feet, and my kids and my grandkids have had their pictures taken there. And when we went to Norway, we went to Norway to meet the relatives, and they had a neighbor who said, oh, he'd been to Alexandria, and he showed us in Norway his picture of him standing in front of Big Ole. So that was interesting to see Big Ole's picture over there, too. Big Ole has had several paint jobs. He has had his in, inner structure was rusting. You can't sit at a Minnesota street for that many years, over 50 years, and not get some salt on you. So I'm sure that was a problem. But his, it's basically the same, but he has had a lot of renovation work. He's had a lot of plastic surgery. I think Big Ole just represents for a lot of people in this area, there were so many Scandinavian Americans from here that it represents kind of that Minnesota Scandinavian culture too. From Alexandria, we travel far north to Rainier. Big Vic has a rather unique origin story. He was created as a form of protest. I'm Pete Schultz. I'm the director of the International Falls Rainier and Rainy Lake Convention and Visitors Bureau. And Rainier is an important part of our tourism mix. Uh, it's a fun little lakeside community. And uh, Vic the Voyager will greet you to Rainier. Vic came into existence as a protest of Voyager's National Park. Vic Davis had the statue made and put it on an island he owned within the park as a protest of the park's attempts to hold back on any development of land because, of course, they were trying to acquire all the land in the park for the park. That first statue, Vic, was confiscated by the Park Service. After uh, Vic was confiscated, uh, Mr. Davis had another statue made that was an exact duplicate, and that became Big Louie. And Louie was uh, added to a piece of land that uh, Vic owned, again, in the park, but this time, directly across from the brand new Rainy Lake Visitor Center, so it was far more visible. And uh, through the process of the whole uh, objection to the first statue being confiscated, the courts had uh, said that they could not remove Louis as uh, it was his right to uh, protest and to do so with a statue of that type on his own property. In the end, uh, Vic Davis, I believe, uh, prevailed, and then the statues were removed, uh, and Vic, because it had been confiscated, was donated to the city of Rainier by the Park Service, and Louis, because Vic still owned him, was sold to uh, a restaurant in Barnum. So if you come to our area and you get a photo with uh, Vic at the entrance to Rainier, you're going to want to uh, go to Barnum and have lunch because uh, outside the restaurant you'll be able to meet the twin brother Louis. Voyagers National Park is so named because of the voyagers, the French fur traders that uh, carried trade goods into the uh, North American continent and generally carried uh, beaver pelts out. The beaver pelts of course were a huge part of the fashion statements going on in uh, Europe and demand was very high. So that's how money was made for the uh, early folk of North America. And the trade goods, of course, the uh, natives uh, clamored to have some steel knives and things of that nature. And the uh, French fur traders clamored to have the uh, beaver pelts in return. And so the voyagers uh, would pack these materials in and out throughout North America. And this was part of the major waterway. In fact, uh, it's a point of interest that the 
way they resolved the border dispute after the Revolutionary War was to state that the northern border would follow the route of the voyagers, the flow of the water, from Lake Superior to the furthest northwest outlet on Lake of the Woods. And by doing so, uh, that's how we established the border between Minnesota and Ontario, even though Minnesota did not at the time exist. Every attraction is important in terms of tourism. People will go out of their way to visit various attractions, and, and the whole trick is to getting people to know about them. Uh, people have been coming to International Falls and Rainy Lake for years because of the recreational opportunities. Uh, like fishing and ice fishing, sledding, snowmobiling, you know, all the types of standard things. But there are a number of people that come because they are just collecting some uh, attractions. So attractions are very important, but uh, it's, it's a whole kind of thing. Uh, the area has some mystique of its own. It has attractions. It has recreational opportunities. All of it helps to uh, bring people here. And tourism is the number three leg of our economy after timber products and uh, transportation and uh, I believe that it will only grow. We follow the route of the voyagers west along the Rainy River to an unmarked unaffiliated attraction that was created as a labor of love by an area musician. Basehenge is certainly worth a stop. This place is called Basehenge. For me, that's a, the name I stuck on it, and that's the name I always think of it as. This is Basehenge. You want to see Basehenge? Come with me. <laughs> My name is Joe Gustafeste. I was principal bassist of Chicago Symphony for 49 years. My wife was living up here, actually, before I retired, and as soon as I retired, I came up to live. Uh, permanently up here. Sold our place in Chicago, and that was it. And uh, we're outside of Birchdale, about oh, um, 10 miles, I think. And uh, International Falls is in the other direction. You know, this area doesn't have a heck of a lot of art. It has a lot of beauty, you know, natural beauty, but not much art, you know. And uh, I figured, well, you know, I have this land here, and we own it and uh, why not take a chunk of it and put some kind of art on it. This whole project came to mind after seeing Stonehenge in, uh, outside London. While we were in, uh, in London with the Chicago Symphony, yeah, we went out there and you know, checked it out. Before that, I hadn't thought of any kind of uh, bases or building any kind of monuments or anything. You know, but as soon as I saw the Stonehenge thing, you know, bang, it clicked, and I, I decided, well, I'm going to investigate if I can come up with something like a base hinge, you know. I just asked Matthew Owens and uh, Sam Agrees to come up with, uh, you know, some design, and I designed one myself. Mine, to me, looks like, uh, you know, a female shape. <laughs> anyway, that's you know where I'm coming from, and, and Richard Hunt did a violin for, a, uh, for Stravinsky's Pulcinella that uh, I had done at his studio, and uh, used his little copy to blow up, you know, and uh, Matthew Owens uh, did that shape. And the lentils were done by Sam Agri, you see, he was a, a student of mine too. He, he did all the, the, the things up on top, lintels, they call it. I proceeded to uh, have Matthew Owens do the uh, drawings and the sheets, you know, cutouts for Leland Nelson to copy and steal. And that's what he did. He copied those uh, cutouts, did them in three inch steel, you know. And so that's what you, uh, we're looking at here. He's a, a very cool guy because he, he got me a cement guy, Eugene Mulberg, and uh, they go nine feet into the ground, so cement things, so that's pretty sturdy. That's going to be sitting there for a long time, and they're cemented in. The shape is in a base clef, and the 
uh, bases are, each one has uh, two different uh, bases connected with it. And the lintel, they're supposed to depict the seven deadly sins. That's what the, mint, uh, the lintels were depicting. And how he worked that out, I'm not sure. <laughs> but that's what they are supposedly depicting. We have the G clef. We have, on my base, the bass clef. That's the base, the big bass in the center. And, and the um, tenor clef, which is west. The bass clef was actually the start of the, uh, the columns, all going all the way around to that edge. That's, you know, a bass clef is like a, a big C. So it was all the way around. The spot, you know, I didn't do anything to it. It just was open in the center like this. It seemed like a good setting for, for you know, something of this sort. <laughs> you know, I could, had enough room, I had no big trees growing in the center of it, you know, to block it out and so it just seemed like a perfect spot to me you know, it just looked right you know I was thinking of making a path in and doing all that stuff and then I said you know the liability is ridiculous you know I'm not gonna if people want to go in there they go in there at their own risk I pick good artists <laughs> I know how to do that <laughs> if I'm not a great artist myself I know how to pick good artists so uh, I got these guys on the, on the thing, and you know, this is how it all came about. A large settlement of Finnish people helped shape the town of Managa, where St. Urho proudly stands. My name is Larry Cargilla. We are currently in the Monaga Museum, which is behind the St. Otto statue. The statue in and of itself, it seems to be a draw. A lot of the people that stop at the museum stop because they see the, the statue and then we have a sign that says uh, open museum. We keep track of uh, the people that visit in a book and the number grows every year and uh, Last year, we had a phenomenal amount of people who actually, from other countries, that, that number grows every year, too. There was a professor at Bemidji State University. His name was Solo Havumaki, and he uh, kind of wrote the legend of St. Orho, and, and the legend is that St. Orho chased the grasshoppers out of Finland and saved the grape crop. Uh, well, the majority of, of Finland is above the Arctic Circle, so both grapes and, and wine are kind of a testament to falsehood. But, they, uh, but that's the story. He, he wrote the story, and it got picked up, and there's, there's enough Finnish heritage here in Managa uh, that it, it, it was picked up, and the people in the 70s and 80s ran with it. In... Uh, 1975, Monaga Civic and Commerce Association held a contest and they chose a design by a young lady here in town by the name of Rita Seppala. And it was her drawing that they used as the pattern or the design for the St. Odo statue. They laminated an oak block which they sent to the Twin Cities to a, to a sculptor and he was supposed to do the, to, to the St. Odo statue and he just never did it. So um, the, uh, Mark Hepikoski and a bunch from the Civic and Commerce went down to the cities, got the, got the block, brought it back to Monaga, and this is many years later now, this is 1982. They had a, a gentleman by the name of Jerry Ward who was a chainsaw carver do the do. And if you've seen the statue, he did a pretty nice job. That stood for a, you know, a few years, and then the weather and uh, teenagers were a bit abusive to it, and so they took the oak statue down, pulled the fiberglass 
mold of it and then made a fiberglass statue and then painted that up. And that's what we have now today is that fiberglass statue. But that's how, that's how the statue came to be. And it's, Monaga is probably one of the better known uh, points of interest with regard to St. Orho. And it is big, it, St. Orho's day is the day before St. Patrick's Day. And so we have a parade, there's, there's various places to eat. Uh, there's, there's a lot of celebration, there's a dance, they have bands and stuff up at the VF. And, so it, 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 they try to make it as big a deal as they can. And it's gotten, it's actually grown quite a bit every year. During the St. Orho weekend, we have a, uh, the Finns have what they call, their version, their word for soup is moyaka. So we have moyaka and flatbread. We serve that here during that St. Orho Saturday. We actually had a professor from the University of Helsinki who was here a couple years ago and spent a bunch of time in Monaga as well as in Finland, Minnesota. And uh, he, he's writing, he's doing research and writing a paper about the, the history, the legend of St. Orho. I think it, it, it gives the, the town a focus, something to put their efforts into to make other people aware of their little town a lot of people stop because of the statue. What is the statue about? They read the story, but they want more. It's, it's become, oh, Monaga, that's the town with the statue. That's the, that's the phrase you hear a lot. It's had a very positive effect for Monaga. Our last stop is International Falls, where the iconic Smoky Bear statue reminds us to prevent forest fires. are in Smoky Bear Park, home of uh, the 26-foot-tall Smoky Bear statue. Not the only one in the nation, but perhaps the most recognized one. Well, here in International Falls, of course, Smoky Bear represents forest fire prevention, and that's a very important thing to our area. It's a wood products uh, and uh, forest products uh, economy. In the 1950s, uh, a forest fire could uh, easily stall the economy uh, for quite some time. So preventing forest fires was very important. If you're familiar with the history of Minnesota, you also know that there were a lot of uh, forest fires that caused a lot of havoc for a lot of areas. The Cloquet Fire, the uh, uh, fire in uh, Hinckley come to mind, those types of things. So 1954 was when Smokey was constructed and dedicated. And I think it was maybe a prior year to that they, they started all the planning. And uh, the whole concept was to have uh, a large uh, means of promoting forest fire prevention. Growing up around here, even as kids, you pretty soon learned that the words only you were followed by can prevent forest fires. And there was even a Smokey Bear song. And when I, when I say Smokey Bear, it brings to mind uh, something that all of the locals here will point out to you, Smokey has no middle name. We see tourists all the time that come and say, where's Smokey the Bear? I don't know where Smokey the Bear is, but I can tell you where Smokey Bear is. Smokey Bear was created, I believe, in 1944 as an advertising icon to prevent forest fires. And in 1950, there was a forest fire at Capitan, New Mexico, where a bear cub was singed and, and burned that needed medical attention. And that bear cub became Smokey Bear, who ended up in the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and was Smokey Bear there uh, promoting forest fire prevention for decades and decades. I think he died in the 70s. I don't think I'd call it a major refurbishment. Uh, uh, Smokey, uh, unfortunately, was uh, attacked by some vandals at one point, and there was a fire, and the fire damage had to be repaired. And uh, shortly after that, Smokey was repainted, and I think he's been repainted a couple of times since, so that they try to keep the, the paint fresh and keep it looking nice. Uh, I think the biggest thing that has to do with any uh, changes with Smokey is the seasonal wear that he uh, dons from time to time. Uh, if you're here in the winter, you'll find him wearing a buffalo check uh, coat, 
and, uh, and a hat. And likewise, the Cubs are dressed for winter and have some winter recreation gear, some, some skates and a sled. I believe that it was Gladys Wolf, uh, who was one of the uh, uh, local ladies involved in a lot of things in the community, that got people together to make the first winter clothing for uh, Smokey Bear. And uh, it was kind of a wry thing of poor Smokey sitting out in the winter weather. He needs a little protection in those poor cubs. Right now, Smokey is wearing a fishing vest because the International Falls Bass Championship just concluded. And Smokey wears the fishing vest for the fishing tournament, obviously. The city maintains Smokey as part of Smokey Bear Park. But it's not just the city. Uh, there are oftentimes some volunteer groups that help, like, for instance, with the seasonal clothing and things like that. But it is a city park and city maintained. We get people that come to the Convention and Visitors Bureau counter all the time that are asking, where is Smokey Bear so we can get our photo with Smokey? They saw somebody else's photo they, that had been to International Falls. And of course, if you're here, you got to get a photo with Smokey. Minnesota Roadside Attractions is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money by the vote of the people November 4, 2008.